Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for bringing your praise to the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night. My, my, my. I feel the presence of the Lord in this house. Thank you so much for being here. You can be seated tonight. We are going to finish this handout this evening because next week's lesson was a little bit shorter. It's good to have uh, the Sanders is also with us tonight as well. Uh, I started looking at my calendar. I said, this ain't Sunday, but I'm glad to have you on Wednesday night. I'd love to see it a whole lot more often. I know uh, they live just up the road here and... Uh, Sarah has made a lot of friends in the back, but who are we kidding? Darlene and Steve have made friends as well. So, uh, But I know Sarah enjoys that Sunday school program. She's not even here. Oh, my goodness gracious. She's going to be mad at you knowing that you came and she wasn't here. I'm telling you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, yes. We are continuing a series tonight that we began two weeks ago. And uh, appreciate uh, you bringing those back with you if you need one. I know they have a few, and they were trying to catch people as they came in tonight. But if you need one of the handouts, just lift your hand. I see Sister Linda Alley's needing those, and the Sanders is on the back. will need those as well. Brother Michael needs one. And what I have tonight after church, you if you have missed any of these lessons, I've got a piece of paper that's 1 through 31 or 32. Uh, it's got all the answers so that you can go back through and fill it out and study those other lessons because I knew that was coming after last week. And I know a few people didn't even get it last week um, because we ran out of copies. Thank the Lord they came and fixed that copy machine uh, this week. And so uh, next Wednesday night we're going to start the Inward Holiness part of this series. And then after we do the Inward Holiness, we'll do Outward Holiness. So if you know, want to know what's coming, you can look on the back of the handout booklet that we have and it will outline those. Now, I can't say that all those will be one lesson apiece, as like tonight, we're doing two lessons in one. Brother Tim Kennedy is going to need one as well, Brother Tim. Sorry about walking you around here. I'm glad you're doing well tonight, but I was trying not to over, overextend him as well this evening. It's good to have you in the house of the Lord on this Wednesday night. I'm going to go ahead and start tonight because, again, I'm going to combine these two. Principles are unchangeable laws that exist. Whether you're talking about the natural world or the spiritual world, it's still the same. Principles exist. Gravity is a natural law or principle that determines the direction of moving objects within the Earth's atmosphere. For example, apples fall to the ground. Parachuters jump from planes and immediately begin to fall. The principle of gravity cannot be changed, but we've found ways to overcome the principle with a greater effort like airplanes, space shuttles. If there's a greater effort than the law of gravity, you can overcome it. The plan of salvation, that's a basic principle or a law that every person must obey to get into heaven. When a person is born again of the water and of the spirit, then the person has obeyed a spiritual principle. That person will receive the reward of heaven. The plan of salvation is a principle that's written in the word of God and cannot be changed. Somebody say amen. So even before a person knows about the existence of a principle, we are still subject to the power of that principle. Now I want you to think about gravity tonight. Brother Michael, even before Isaac Newton was sitting under the apple tree and that apple fell out and hit him in the head, he was still subject to the law of gravity. Now, there, this is going to probably cross some theology. Before we realize the principle of the plan of salvation, we're still subject to it. My Bible says, if the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So there are principles. Whether I'm aware of the principle or not, I'm subject to it. All right? Even if a person doesn't know about the plan of salvation, he or she will be subject to the principle at death. Hebrews 9.27 tells us that it is appointed unto men wants to die, but after this, the judgment. The verse doesn't point out any differences between those who obeyed the principle and those who do not. He just simply says everybody's going to stand in judgment. It says unto men, which means all people. So even if a person does not fully understand the principle, he or she will still be held accountable for that principle. Every person will still be under subjection to the principle's rules and rewards. So, let me talk a little bit about mankind's sinful nature. You've heard me say it a lot. I don't believe inside of every man is something good. I believe God has to place the good inside of us. To understand the importance of living by principle, we must understand some basic facts about us, mankind. We are all born sinners, according to Romans 3.23. We have the nature of our father, Satan, according to John 8.44. 
even with the power of the Holy Ghost, it is still difficult to overcome sinful natures if you don't stay submitted to that power. You don't believe me? Look at this, Romans 7. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Now, this is a man that's full of the Holy Ghost writing this. He said, if then I do that which I would not. Man, I hated memorizing this in Bible quiz. And Sister Debbie, I remember that year. Lord, have mercy. That's one of those verses I couldn't quote real fast. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not. Here's that verse. But the evil which I would not that I do. Boy, ain't that just confusing if you tried to read that without understanding it. Then look at this. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law, or I see another principle, Brother White, in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he says this in verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. What he is saying here is if we don't keep the flesh under control, it don't matter how long you speak in tongues on Sunday. If your flesh is going to run your life on Monday and the rest of the week, it's doing you no good. He said you got to crucify that flesh. We've got to die out to that sinful nature that's inside of us. If I don't get up and start my day with prayer by the AC, there's going to be a good chance that my flesh is going to take over in that day. And I, I have to understand that. I, I've got to understand that it doesn't matter how good of a person I may be, good people can still make bad choices and end up doing wrong things. We must first obtain salvation before we can obtain holiness. I'm going to hit this a lot during this series. Every person must be born again, according to John 3 and Acts 2.38. A born-again Christian will receive a new nature. That's why I said mankind's got a sin nature. But you get a new nature through the Holy Ghost if you'll stay renewed in it. With the Holy Ghost, a person has the ability. I want everybody to say ability to overcome sin. He didn't say with the Holy Ghost, every person was going to overcome sin. You've got to exercise the ability. Amen. Every time you reach out to grab something you're not supposed to have, the Holy Ghost ain't going to pull your arm back. You've got to have the ability to overcome. There are some things that we must understand. I, I, I've heard people say, well, I prayed that the Lord would just shut every door so I'd know that it wasn't the right thing. That's not always the right thing to pray. You need discernment. You need the Holy Ghost to be able to speak to you and let you know. So there, there is a process that we're going through, folks. A process of holiness. Holiness simply means this. Some people ask me, well, what is holiness? Holiness means conformity to the character of God. Don't use the verse as a cop-out. His thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are higher than my ways. Quit using that as a cop-out because Paul said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. What it means is I've got to let him take control of my mind. I've got to let him direct my path. It means I can think like he would think. I can love what he loves. I can't hate what he hates. I can act as Christ would act because holiness is a process. Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men in holiness. And then he says some very pointed things. Without which no man shall see the Lord. This blew me away. Brother Charles, as soon as I saw this, I called Dad. I said, Dad, I want you to hear this. I, I've never thought about this before. And, and, and Dad helped me do a little digging for this lesson, and I appreciate it. Moses and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, they were not all on the same level of holiness. God forbade the children of Israel. He said, don't you touch the mountain where the presence of God met with Moses. But then I find a little later, the Lord lets Moses take 70 elders up a little ways on the very mountain that he told the rest of them, don't touch. 
But then there still came a point where Aaron and the elders had to stay back. And God said, Moses, you're a little higher up on this thing of holiness. I need you to come up to the top of the mountain so I can talk to you. Don't look down on somebody else because they're not on the same spot on the mountain that you're at right now. This thing is a process. And we've got to grow in this, okay? So as Christians, we must understand people are in the process of holiness. We're at different levels in our knowledge and understanding of God. That doesn't mean we don't hold a certain standard for our platform. It doesn't mean we don't hold a certain standard for our leadership. But we must trust that God and the man of God will determine if somebody's just stubbornly refusing to obey the word of God or if they don't understand it yet. All right? I've heard... Now, now... I, there's a little different in, in my reprimand when, when, when Elise would come out with a word that she, she didn't know what it meant. And I'm not talking about a cuss word. I'm talking about maybe a word that, that would have been misinterpreted. You know, uh, just for instance, okay, gay back in, in the early times meant something different than it does today. That's something I don't want really just coming out of my daughter's mouth a lot. All right, so she may have heard it and that come out. That's a little different than if she knew she wasn't supposed to say something. My reprimand or the discipline there is probably a little bit tougher because I know she's just either being stubborn or, or just, just blatant out, plain out, just rebelling against what I've asked her not to do. We have to understand there are some things that people do, it's because they don't understand yet. And the way we need to pray is God give them the understanding. We don't meet people at an altar and give them a rule book. That's not the way we do things. We allow holiness to be a process. Here's the thing. My parents learned really quick, and I've learned this even with Elise in, in doing a little bit of homeschooling this year. If you tell somebody something, they're going to forget it easier than if they figure it out for themselves. I can't tell you how many times a day uh, Elise said, Dad, what's this word? And I'll stop and say, nope, sound it out. I'm not reading it for you. Because you're learning to read. And so then I found out we're reading a whole page. And they got certain words, Amos, that they'll use over and over and over because they're wanting to learn how to read it. And sometimes the story doesn't make sense. They could have said the story in five sentences, but they want to go over and over and over it. So, so in that word, after I helped her the, just today learn the word created. As she would sound it out. As, That's right. We read the word created five times after that without me having to help her. Why? Because she figured it out. There is some things in holiness that the Spirit of God is going to lead and teach and help us to understand. But it's not right of us. because the, well, We talked about it last week, judging not unless we would be judged with that same meat. And, and I don't think that's fair to judge somebody when they don't understand the same way that we would be judged if we do that. Holiness is a continual process. It is a cleansing. If a person does not continue in the process, what happens? They're going to forfeit that born-again status. Paul said you got to live godly in this present world. Holiness is a two-part process, and it is from this world or worldliness and, and dedication to God. So I want to talk about that separation tonight. The Bible offers a lot of examples uh, of God's call for separation for his people from the world. You have Abram and his family. They had to separate from Ur of the Chaldees. Abram, Abraham and Lot had to separate from each other at one point. The children of Israel had to leave Egypt. God has always required that his people be something separate and set apart from everyone and everything else. John 15, 19. Because you are not of the world but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. You want to know why some people can't stand you right now? It's because of holiness. It's part of the Bible. In Romans 12 and verse 1, he tells us we're not to conform to this world. What did I say holiness was? Conforming to the character of God. So he says, don't conform to this world, but I need you to actually be transformed. It's something completely different. I need you to be completely different than the world that is around you. So true holiness starts showing the separation. This does not mean that we look at what the world is doing and we do everything different. Well, that went over good. It's not what it means. Thank God we got electricity tonight. That doesn't mean that we just preach against something because the world does it. We need a principle. And this is where we're going with this study because there's some things that we need to be very careful about. God may just be dealing with you on something. 
Paul said, I'm not, or we talked about it Sunday, uh, about how that the, the early church, they, they were talking about the circumcision. He said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. This ain't right. This is not right. We've got to make sure we've got a biblical standpoint for what we're preaching and teaching. Paul did not tell Timothy, you go out there and you said a bunch of stuff just on your own. He said, you preach the word. If we don't have word or principle from the word of God, it don't need to be coming across the pulpit. It don't need to be enforced in our lives. We need to let the Spirit of God, if He's dealing with you on something, then don't you quench the Spirit's what the Word says. You allow the Spirit to direct you. And that doesn't mean that we look at this pulpit and we say, well, I don't agree with that. That doesn't mean that at all. We have to conform to what the Word of God says. But there may be some things that go above and beyond what the Word says for us because what? God just wants me to be saved. And if he sees something that's going to be a stumbling block to me or he sees something that's going to keep me from heaven because it's going to be too important and knock the Lord out of first place in my life, then, then I need to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. So what it means is we live our lives according to the principles of the Word of the Lord. We don't allow the culture, we don't allow the motives and the trends of the world to guide our lives. In other words, we don't change our beliefs because the world seems to be moving in a different direction. I'm a little concerned today because there's some things that it seems like the religious world's trying to back up on just because so culture and society is changing. We must balance our lives by living in this world, but not just blindly adapting our beliefs to an ever-changing culture. And this is why you got to build your holiness on the Word of God. If you read the entire book of Judges, it is the story of a people that struggles to maintain their separation from worldly cultures around them. And when the children of Israel lived their lives and they guided their actions according to the commandments of God given to Moses, then they were blessed and then they were, pro they were prospering. But then you would find it in Scripture. They'd get their eyes off of the Lord and they'd look at the society and then they'd begin to act and think and look and live like the society around them. And every time, God would pull his blessing. And they began to go down again. The children of Israel would wind up in bondage, and then they'd cry out to God, and, he'd be, and they'd begin to repent, and they'd cleanse themselves, and they'd get holy before God again, and God would send them a deliverer, someone to help them defeat their enemy. Unfortunately, in the word of God, Brother Edward, the cycle just went over and over and over and over with them. I hope we can learn the lesson of the book of Judges that God separated us for his glory. And if we're truly going to be his people and his witness, we do have to be different from the world around us. Separation from the world, it's essential for obtaining holiness, but it is not enough. God expects us to dedicate us, not just to separate from, but he wants us to dedicate to something, and that is to him. Romans 12 tells us, present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Remember that a living sacrifice can get off the altar, and that's why holiness is a continual dedication to the Lord every single day. Ephesians chapter 4 encourages us in verses 22 and 24. I'm not reading it tonight, but it encourages us. You put off the things of the old man. If you still talk the same that you did before you came to the Lord that's not a new man Okay, so we got to put off the old man. We need to be renewed. We got to take on, the scripture says, the new man that's created in righteousness. God desires us to dedicate our lives continually unto Him. It is not enough that we just separate from the world, that's only half of the equation. And the problem with a lot of people in regarding to holiness is they can only work on the separation part of the problem and they strive to be different from the world and as different as they can be, but they do this more as an obligation. God's desire is not that we not only be willing and have understanding regarding our need to be separate from the world, but he desires a close relationship with us. He wants us to take that same tenacity as we're separating from the world to dedicate ourselves to him. And so dedication to God, it's learning to love the Lord with all of my heart. It's studying to show myself approved by learning and understanding the principle and the purpose behind even holiness standards. Holiness was not designed to be lived only from a separation standpoint. God wants us to desire to do holiness because we understand the principle from the word of God and a love in our hearts to be more like him. This is what dedication unto God means. So to understand this concept of separation from the world and this dedication to God. we got to look no further than the children of Israel. God sent them a deliverer to lead them out. Everybody say, that was separation. 
He moved him out from Egypt. Even though there was a temporary struggle for them to accomplish this, they did succeed. They came out of Egypt. They even saw several victories along the way. However, we found that we find rather the dedication to God process is a whole lot more difficult than even just the separating. As they pursued separation, there came a point where God said, I want more than just you to be out of bondage. I want you to dedicate. I want you to trust me. I want you to follow me. So he wanted them to complete the mission that he started. Don't just separate and get out of Egypt. I want to get the Egypt out of you to where you will dedicate yourself completely unto me. They were never intended to just run away from the world. It's not the will of God for us to build our own little colonies and us to live like a bunch of hermits in the back hills somewhere. He says, separate from the world, but dedicate unto. So this is the place where they could rest. That, you know, they, they were never intended just to run away from the world, but they did find themselves standing at the door of Canaan. And this was the place, again, they would rest. They would develop a permanent, close relationship with God. But whereas coming out of Egypt was slightly difficult, they found this dedication part almost insurmountable. In fact, the first time they found themselves there, what did they do? They made a wrong choice. They walked around in the wilderness for 40 years because they couldn't get this dedication to God thing right. And so it would take 40 more years of wandering around in the wilderness, separating from the world, cleansing themselves again. And we have to understand how important both parts of this process are to the Lord. Because without the separation from the world and without this dedication to God, we don't have complete true holiness. So holiness means having no love in my heart for this world. Well, that's a hard thing to say, ain't it? God says, we're committing adultery against him when we love the, more, love the world more than we love him. You say, well, that's kind of strong language. Well, that's what's in his word, James 4 and 4. He said, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So holiness involves two parts of us. And this is where we're getting ready to branch off. And we're going to go down one road, and it's called inward holiness first. But it's two parts of holiness. Inward holiness, that deals with my spirit and my soul. And then outward holiness, that deals with my physical body. The reason that many Christians have trouble obeying the holiness standards long term is because they focused on the issue and not the principle. So I wanted to say this tonight before we got into specifics. People get so consumed by how the issue is affecting them versus being able to understand the need to obey the principle behind the issue. Each time God demanded a holiness separation for his people, there was a spiritual principle behind it. My greatest fear is that we are raising a generation that's trying to obey the issue without getting the principle. The principle is your foundation that will ground you when people question you why you do what you do. If you can't tell them why you look the way you look, why you act the way you act, you need to get the book open and figure it out because there are principles that are behind these things. And we're going to get specific. Don't think I'm going to skirt around it. We're going to get specific. All right? I know the last few times we've, we've done holiness, I've just dealt with generics. But I'm going to get specific this time. The Lord got very clear with me that we need to get specific in some of this on Wednesday night. The issue is the action or the outward standard that we obey. So I'm, I'm separating the issue and the principle, okay? So stay with me. But the issue itself is not the principle. Scripture, all right? I'm going to give this to you. It's clear on the subject of men and women's hair, talking about the cutting, the not cutting the hair, the issue. That's the issue, but that's not the principle. Why do we do it? The principle is submission to authority and what we do with our hair is the evidence that we're in direct obedience or disobedience to the principle. So I'm going to share more regarding this later on in another service, but I'm using that as an example. Okay, here's another one. The issue is speaking with other tongues, but that's not the principle. The principle is salvation. And tongues is simply the outward evidence or the standard that comes that we have obeyed the biblical principle. So this is why I'm saying, let's don't get so consumed with the issues that we miss the principles. The principle is the foundation we're building this life upon. The issue is simply the outward evidence that we've understood and obeyed the principle from the word of God. So that big, the S word, standard, boy, everybody hates that word. 
Christians develop, and this is where I was going a while ago, Christians develop personal standards for living when they dedicate themselves to the Lord. Standards separate Christians from the world. Standards fall under two categories, as I said earlier, inward and outward holiness. So inward holiness, standards include the way that a person thinks, the way a person speaks, personal beliefs about where he or she may not go or things in which he or she may not participate, like drugs and alcohol and pornography and gambling and all this kind of stuff. It also involves smaller acts of holiness like guarding the tongue, keeping a right spirit, renewing our minds, keeping unity among the brethren. That's holiness. But a lot of times the inward holiness is harder to maintain than the outward holiness because inward holiness takes time. Now, I know you think that doll just stood a long time in that mirror and took forever getting ready for church tonight, but that don't take near as long as cleaning up the inside, honey. You can fool people on the outside all you want to. Inward holiness takes time because these things are ingrained inside of us. It is in our actions and in our character. This is where we've got to be completely transformed like Paul said in Romans 12. So some standards are explicitly stated in the Word of God. Some standards develop as a result of some cultural circumstances. While I said a while ago, we don't allow culture to dictate the standard we do have to find principles that help us navigate through these things. And, and because of cultures the way they are, I'll, I'll just give you, we, we've established a principle uh, in, in our classes that, that we, we never want teachers alone with a student. You don't want that because of the way our culture is and, and the way that, you know, before they didn't think nothing about it. You know, you didn't think nothing about uh, just a, a, a little girl jumping up on a, a man's lap back in the 1960s, 50s. You didn't think about those things. But today, things will get said and things are inappropriate. We've got to think about these things when we start applying principles of holiness to our lives. So this is why I'm saying, no, we don't let them tell us, but we look at the world and we say, you know what, I don't want my good to be evil spoken of, so I've got to find a principle that in the Word of God that helps guide me navigating through what seems to be a cultural landmine. <laughs> For instance, we teach safeguards, television, internet, because our culture is parading extremely ungodly messages and visual content in front of our generation. Standards may differ slightly for each Christian at any given time because holiness is a process. But there are some things that are explicitly in the Word of God that we all follow. And, you know, sometimes, and I've had people ask me, well, why does your church do this and why does the next church five, ten minutes down the road not? You know, sometimes the Lord will deal with a pastor because the Lord knows that congregation. So let's don't compare churches. Let's compare uh, what God's speaking to us. Is it to the Word of the Lord? Is there a principle in the Word of God? Okay, so outward or physical standards obtain, uh, pertain rather to a dress code and it should reflect an inward holiness standard of modesty because you know what, it doesn't matter how holy you try to dress on the outside if something on the inside is not right uh, it's, it's going to show eventually because holiness is a process and because Jesus tells us that it begins inwardly more often than not, outward standards can take a while to manifest themselves in new believers just remember, this is a process remember Mount Sinai, you have to give time you have to let teaching happen and the process of illumination for that new believer. However, outward holiness is also a sign of the condition of somebody who's been walking with God. And I put your hand out for a while. That, that word for a while, those words for a while, I don't mean a long time. I've seen people that, you know, some people get on this journey of holiness and it's almost like they, they accelerate so fast. They're going 120 miles an hour and in a week's time you couldn't told what they looked like the week before. I'm not saying that, that it can't happen fast. The Lord does that in a different process with different people and how quickly that happens, I can't give you a timeline. But it does happen. Outward holiness starts reflecting the inside. Let me use the example of a shepherd. We see that the only way he knows that something's wrong with the sheep in his care is by how they're acting. If there is, uh, even, even just a normal animal in your house, that dog or that cat just starts laying around and they're normally hyper, you know something's wrong. Outward signs are starting to notify you something's wrong on the inside. So it's the same way with the shepherd and the sheep. If they're sheep that's active in the front of the fold and they're playing, they're eating well, their coat looks healthy, then the shepherd knows most likely that sheep's okay. However, if that sheep all of a sudden gets lethargic, doesn't get excited anymore, he's straggling along behind the fold and there's outward signs that they're sick. 
And the shepherd becomes concerned that something is wrong on the inside. So let me say this. God does the same thing with our outward holiness. Some people start slacking up on the dress. They'll start holding the wallet. They'll quit tithing. They'll start trimming or start fudging it a little bit. And then we lack on our worship. And then we back up on ministry opportunities. And then we stop coming to church. There's signs here to tell the shepherd there's a problem on the inside. God uses those things to let us know we're moving in the wrong direction. Remember the example I gave you previously about being a stumbling block for somebody in the wrong direction. That's the pastor's job in our life, to be that spiritual thermometer and let us know we're moving in the wrong direction. Outward holiness is often the first sign that God starts giving a pastor to know there's something wrong here. There's a spiritual condition that's lacking. The cause of Lucifer's fall began inwardly, but it manifested itself outwardly. Cain's outward countenance reflected his inward thought process. We can never discount inward or outward holiness, but realize, we must realize they work together as evidence of understanding the principle behind the issue. So now we've seen that the order of holiness is vitally important to God. Let's see how we should live. Luke 6. Jesus tells us how we should live if we want to produce holiness that will make us acceptable unto him and to his plan for our lives. For the canon, I'm probably about five minutes away from being done. He said, be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, you won't be judged. Condemn not, you don't have to be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. For a good tree bringeth forth not corrupt fruit. Neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit, for every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. Look at this. For of the abundance of the heart... His mouth, listen to what's being said, and it's going to tell you what's going on on the inside. As a kid, I never could get by with anything because I'd tell on myself. (laughs) You know what? We don't outgrow those things. We have to let the, the Lord help us. One of the biggest things in church today is is people upsetting somebody with their mouth. He said the tongue is a deadly poison. And you know what's uh, what's so bad about that is sometimes you don't even have to mean it the wrong way. And boy, somebody can take it wrong. My God. And we have to be careful. Because you know what, Brother White, I can have a bad day. And the same sentence that my wife said to me the day before might not rest near as good on me that day. But i got to be careful because I understand it's not her that's got the problem. It was me. And sometimes we have to understand that that tongue can get us in trouble. Now, I was always raised that if you don't have nothing nice to say, yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that in pastoring, sometimes I've not had to make some decisions and had to do some things that I didn't want to have to do. And, I, I, you know, I used, to, I used to say it when I was a teenager and I was, I was doing music. I, I was about 17 one time. I remember Dad came home. And he told me, he said, so-and-so's not going to be singing Sunday. And I said, well, Dad, if I was pastor, I, he said, son, don't ever say that. And now he reminds me of that conversation, Brother Steve. You said if you was pastor, how are you handling it now, you know? <laughs> You look at it different from this chair. See, I don't find in the word of God, you know, how did that work out for Job, Brother Tim, when he went to God and started trying to tell him all that stuff, and, and Job started putting him in, or the Lord started putting Job in place. He said, where were you when I started putting the stars in place? And what were you doing? You know, you wouldn't even develop an eyelids, young man. What, what is wrong with you? 
we got to understand sometimes it's easy to even be couch pastors and want to judge what's going on on the platform when you don't know the consecration that's going on behind the scenes to even get that person there to where they are right now. This holiness thing is a process, and I've got to allow the process to happen. What would happen if I, dis if I disrupted the process of the making of cheese? And I got it too soon. You know what would happen? I'd get sick. You've got to allow that thing to mature. You've got to allow that butter and that, that everything to, to churn just right, or that, that, that milk and everything to just churn just right. And when it gets solid, then it's ready to eat. But if I go in there and I try to eat that too soon, it's going to hurt me. This thing is a process, and I must allow the process to happen. If we are merciful, God can be merciful to us. He said, not if we fail, but when we fail. We cannot be perfect. You know what? We're all going to be in need of mercy one day. And that's when I stand before God. And I don't want him to look and say, you know what? You didn't give mercy to such and such. I can't give you mercy. Matthew 5 and 7, Jesus tells that the merciful people are blessed because they can obtain mercy. Luke 6, Jesus says, don't judge or you're going to get judged like you judged. Don't condemn so that you don't have to be condemned. Don't forgive so that you can be forgiven. We cannot receive blessings and goodness and long-suffering and understanding unless we're willing to give blessings and goodness and long-suffering and understanding. It's the principle of sowing and reaping here again. And just as we can sow and reap bad things, we can also sow and reap good things. I'm thankful for that. Remember, whether we sow, that whatever we sow, rather, we will reap again. Luke 6 tells us that. Jesus explains, trees produce what's in the seed. If we want God and others to be long-suffering with us, then I must return the favor. And if I want the seeds of judgment and condemnation, then those are the things that are definitely going to be produced by my mouth and my life. Remember, every time I speak, I'm sowing seeds in the people that are around me. Whatever attitude I produce, my children are going to produce eventually. People who say that everyone is always talking about them or their children might ought to check their own mouths in their own home. They're probably reaping what they've sown. So we got to be careful. Jesus ended the words in Luke 6. He said, for of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Look out, mouth, you're telling on me. <laughs> you're letting know what's going on deep down in my heart. I'm thankful today that I can plant the right seeds. I can do the right things. I can take the right steps, and I can be holy before God. Me and dad had a conversation one time about the principles, even as, as the, of the church. And we had a conversation about how that, you know, there was, there was things that the old timers preached long before we really had the understanding like we do now uh, that they had more wisdom than what people realized at those days. And uh, we talked about how church culture is trying to change. And I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but there, there, there are other even religious organizations, I guess is the best way to word it, the bar just kept getting lowered and lowered and lowered to now we're, we're trying to accept lifestyles that are totally an abomination to the Lord. Where does the lowering of the bar stop? And, 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 and it, was, it was a statement that was made on a minister's forum not long ago, and I say a minister's forum, it was a UPCI minister's forum that said, you know, I don't feel so bad about this, that, and the other because other organizations are, are, are lowering their standard now. And, and, and I, I thought the whole time I was reading this, and it, it was not the consensus of most of those ministers, by the way. It was just this one lone ranger out there, and he found out real quick he was off base. But he was out there said, just saying, you know, I don't feel so bad because when you look over here, they're starting to accept things that are just totally wrong. And I thought, you know what, where does it start? It started with that denomination. If I named it, I could walk you through their history. It started with them backing up on holiness and backing up on things. And then it ends up now where we're totally going against the word of God. Be careful that you don't remove a fence without asking the person that put the fence there why the posts are where they are. <laughs> Everyone forget it. I wish mom was here tonight. I'd have her tell the story. We had lived in that house for over 20 years. Me and Jared was old enough to mow. I was mowing. He was weed eating that day. And mom would get these whims that we're just going to change the yard and here's what we're going to do. 
Finally, she got aggravated because, you know, Jared was getting frustrated with the weed eater. That chain link fence was eating his cord about as long as he was trying to cut that grass. Mom said, boys, we're going to change this because there's a brick wall right here. and We're going to cut this chain link fence. Brother White, we had barely got started cutting that chain link fence. And we were informed that was not our fence. We thought that was our fence for over 20 years. <laughs> Real quick, my neighbors to come out that big cowboy hat. What are y'all doing to my fence? And I was like, oh, man. Mom said, boys, let's put this fence back together. <laughs> Be careful before you start removing a fence because you may not know why that fence is there and whose fence that was. On the other side, I didn't want to cut that fence. They had a, a child dog. Lion looking dogs. I didn't. We didn't want to tear that fence down. But the other one, we was okay with. Be careful what fences you want to try to remove. You may not understand the principle that was behind that fence. I've been also to neighborhoods where they had a gate at the front, but the, each yard still had a fence. Personal homes had fences. Why? Because they want to keep children safe or maybe an animal in or whatever. We may set fences and gates as a church, but you may have to put some personal fences up and say, you know what, we're going to go just a step further in holiness and this is what's going to be right for our house. Other families, you know, may do this because every, every child will do it. They'll say, well, so-and-so, and then they'll give you that statement well I'm not so and so's well, yeah I'm not so and so's parents we've all heard it we have to set those fences and help our families to understand here's the principles behind it here's the reasons why we're doing it maybe it was a back a, a backstory that that your family maybe they've struggled with this that or the other and you know what we don't want to let that happen in our lives and so we're going to lay this principle and take them to the word of God show them the principle show them the understanding there and say this is what was going to be right for us. Let's stand together tonight. I do believe in standards and I do believe in principles of holiness. And I would encourage you this week, even to have a discussion. If you've still got children at home, have that discussion about, about what those standards are in our lives and why they're there. Because I know they're not in here on this series. And I've, I've thought about it when we get a little more specific on some of these things. I may ask for the seat to keep those young people in here because I do believe it's very important for every generation to understand why we are who we are, why we do what we do. Let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your spirit today. And I thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, oh God, that you would help this word to take root in our lives. Lord, let it germinate. I don't want to offend. I don't want to hurt anybody today. And if I've said anything tonight, Lord, that has done that, I pray, Lord, that you would mend those wounds. Lord God, that you would help us to understand that your word, sometimes it cuts, but sometimes it does it with a purpose and you're trying to take some things out of us so that we can be saved. Help us today, Lord, to approach this, this series, the rest of this series, God, as we get a little more in detail about inward holiness for the next few weeks and then going into outward holiness. Help us to keep approaching this as we said in the first lesson with an open mind, a right attitude submitted unto you, God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Would you worship the Lord one more time in this house? We're going to sing together, but would you love him all across this place tonight? Would you thank him for his goodness? is what I long for.
you lift your hands one more time and let's thank him for his spirit in this house today. I believe if we mix that with his spirit, if we mix that word with what he's doing in this house today, we can have that understanding. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Remember again, we have uh, this picture on auction. Make sure you have a bulletin as well. Got a great weekend in store for us. Looking forward to what the Lord is going to do. Harvest Connect Saturday. Uh, you have one in Jackson. The one in Jackson will be at my house. The one here in Humboldt will be here at the church. The reason we're doing those, we're doing one at a house, and then we're going to do two more later on in the next month. Uh, the reason for that is, I know sometimes these dates don't always work, but we also want to try to get new people. I've already heard of possibly one that will meet with us as a new person in Jackson, and we're going to be studying the life of Joseph a little bit more. If you've got those envelopes, you don't have to bring them this week. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you when you need to bring those envelopes that you've wrote things in from the first one. Shake hands together. You're dismissed. Thank you for being here tonight. God bless you. You can see Brother Tim. He's got the answers to all of these handouts. Thank you.